Just this road. 
Let it 
all God's people said, amen. At this time, uh, yeah, go ahead. Come on up, Jeremy. <clears throat> for those of you that could make it this morning, it's great to see all of you here. Take a moment and uh, greet each other for a couple minutes. Wonderful to see you all greet each other. I always wondered if we didn't do anything, if you just, how long you would go. Well, this, it's really beautiful to wake up to snow on the ground if you live low enough where normally you don't have snow. But I know for some people that beauty can turn into not so beautiful after a while when it gets too heavy. But I'm really thankful for those of you that are able to make it out this morning. We just keep those in prayer that could not dig themselves out yet this morning. And hopefully they can uh, worship the Lord in their homes but I just want to welcome you, and um, also just want to welcome anyone that might be visiting this morning. Not sure how many visitors may have made it, but maybe you've been coming for a while, but we'd just like to bring attention to our Connect cards. Uh, they're in the back of the chairs, and uh, if, you, if you haven't filled one of those out and you've been coming a couple weeks or so, uh, we just want to encourage you. Maybe today's the day to do that. If you bring it to the Welcome Center in the back, or in the uh, lobby, uh, there's a gift that's there for you, as well as some information about our church. Uh, next week, excitingly, we are going to be kicking off our missions month. Now, normally in the past we've done a missions weekend, but this time we're doing a missions month, and it's, it's really exciting. Um, there's so much that we do at this church involved in missions. It's going to be great to have some time uh, to, to uh, go over different missionaries and the different missions that we support. And so starting next Sunday, we're going to have two guest speakers that are coming, and that's all you're going to get today. So if you want to know who that is, you've got to come next week, okay? Also, do you remember next week, daylight savings time, spring forward. Oh, I would love losing an hour of sleep, but prep for that, just a reminder. Uh, next announcement is we had mentioned before the need for two iPads for the Creative Arts Camp. Well, praise the Lord, two of those have been provided. So, uh, yeah, blessing for that. Um, they are still Creative Arts Camp. That's a big, big, uh, what is what I'm looking for? I'm going to say outfit, but... <laughs> It's a big deal that week. It's a lot of work and a lot of effort and a lot of needs. So uh, there's still more items that they need, and uh, as well as they need volunteers um, for helping out that week. So again, check out the Creative Arts Camp table at the back after church and see how you may continue to, to help in that way. Uh, just a reminder, this morning we started a new 9 a.m. equipping hour. Um, and so we'd really like to encourage you, if you've not come yet, to maybe start coming next week to that. And if you want to see more information about what the topic is and information, there's, there's an entry in the bulletin on that. Also want to bring your attention, there is a new newsletter for March out in the lobby. So we'd like you to pick one of those up. Um, there are a lot of really great articles. I know a number of people put a lot of effort uh, into writing very meaningful articles in here um, that I know I, when I've read have been very touching and helpful. So I just would like to encourage you to pick that up and read through it. And um, yeah, I'm just going to highlight one of these. Oh, I, I know there was in here a recognition of Joe Stromberg for her serving in children's ministry. So very beautiful. Take, take the time to get one of these. And the next thing is, there is a table supposedly over there that has uh, a bunch of donate, or I guess they were lost and found items that are going to finally donate. <laughs> They've been there for a little while. If there's something you may be missing and didn't think to go check that out, maybe go over there and look at it, um, or maybe you can get it for free instead of waiting for it to show up at the thrift store. Um, anyway, that's all the info I got, just that it's going to go to the thrift store after today. So check it out uh, after church and see what may have been yours at one point. And lastly, just a reminder that we have three ways to give here at Grace. Uh, we have our online Banco app that you can have on your phone. Uh, you can give online. Uh, you can mail a check-in. Uh, there's also the box in the back that's put out at the beginning and end of the, of the service for that. So I just want to thank you all for your faithful giving here at Grace. And so, Lord, we just lift up this time to you, and God, we just lift up the gifts that each person here gives so faithfully, Lord. Just There is no greater investment we can have, Lord, than to invest in your people, in the building up and the encouraging of your people, Lord, that we may go out and proclaim your message, Lord. That is the most important, God, to further your kingdoms, because one day, Lord, you are going to return. 
And so we just look forward to that day. Help us to continue to be faithful, to give back to you, Lord, all the things that you have blessed us with, Lord. Thank you now and bless our service today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lent is a time for wrestling within as we wander through our wilderness. It is a time of lamenting the felt separation from our Creator. It is also a time of coming to a deeper experience of the one who has called us to himself. My hope for all of us during this season is that we are able to live honestly before God and find within us the boldness to struggle with God so deeply that at times only a well-crafted psalm of lament will suffice. Feel free to close your eyes as I read this psalm as our prayer today. Psalm 37, verse 1. Do not be agitated by evildoers. Do not envy those who do wrong, for they wither quickly like grass and wilt like tender green plants. Trust in the Lord and do what is good. Dwell in the land and live securely. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
let's all stand for the reading of the word. Good morning. Continuing in our study of Ecclesiastes, I'm going to be reading from chapter 12, verses 9 through 14, essentially the last part of Ecclesiastes. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty, the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, good morning, all of you adventurous spirits, if you've come from uh, snow-covered driveways, uh, snow-covered vehicles, and for those who are coming up from maybe uh, down country, and maybe were surprised that there was snow uh, up here, uh, we welcome you this morning, glad that you are here, and we are happy to gather each week. We are uh, privileged to be in a position where we are because uh, several churches that were above the snow line decided to cancel their services this morning, just too treacherous to ask people to get into their parking lots. Of these, uh, so lots of churches are located on hills, on steep driveways, and, and so grateful that we are able to gather today. So we always count it a privilege and never uh, uh, something we should just presume upon that we can gather so before we start and get, jump into God's word together, let's uh, ask God to bless our time. Father, we are grateful for this day, and we ask that however we find ourselves here today, whatever joys, whatever sorrows accompany us, God, we ask that we would have a sense of your presence here. Lord, minister to our hearts with truth, with wisdom, with consolation. God, help us today as we open up your word to understand who you are more deeply and how much you love us. God, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today... This Sunday marks our final day in the book of Ecclesiastes. We have been grabbing um, prominent themes out of this really important piece of wisdom literature from the Old Testament. Uh, one that it has, and we've said this from the beginning, uh, has often got a bad rap because it appears to be very cynical in its um, proclamations and because it really is someone crying out against the frustrations of what it feels like to live in this world sometimes. Sometimes our best efforts uh, you know, conclude in, in exactly what we'd hoped them to be. But sometimes, after so much effort, everything should be falling into place, and it simply doesn't happen. And that can be so frustrating. And, and I'm talking about even just the most trivial things, but then things that are so important to us that just don't go our way, that we or we experience painful evil that's allowed to touch our lives in a way that we just can't explain. And we have a hard time aligning that with God's good nature and his creation, created order. How come I'm allowed to experience these things and to suffer such pain or see such injustice in the world. And so many things seem to be happening, particularly difficult things, just 
by random chance why a tree would fall one way or another, would miss my house and or not miss my house. Uh, sometimes it just feels so random and we throw up our hands in frustration. The book of Ecclesiastes, the writer of Ecclesiastes, wrestles with this real stuff that affects our lives and he gives us a really important framework from which to, to view the world and to find meaning, to find deep meaning. And so uh, as we study, we're just going to we'll do a little bit of review in the beginning, as we have, and we're going to hopefully conclude where we meant to conclude last Sunday. We're going to add a couple of bonus things this morning. Uh, this We extended our, our study from three weeks to four weeks. And just by way of review, we just want to remember what is the message of Ecclesiastes. And we promoted this as an idea of the writer filling in our biblical worldview or a biblically informed way of seeing the world. And we recognize that there are many competing worldviews, uh, and many of them make sense. That's, that's, uh, God has given us brains and intellect and philosophy, and uh, we have coherent thoughts. And so uh, without God as a, as a framework, we're allowed to come up with all kinds of ways of explaining the world and why it is the way it is. And so there's lots of competing religions. There's a lot of competing worldviews that help guide us to answer some of the key questions of life, things like, where did I come from? Why is there evil in the world? What, what meaning is there in life? Or what happens after I die? These critical questions are answered with any really good, robust worldview. The Bible is no different. Um, I would just argue that the biblical worldview is the best one. It's the one that is most accurate. It most re- reflects the reality of the world we see. Uh, and we'll explain why in a moment. But here's the, the writer of Ecclesiastes' contribution toward that that worldview. So he posits two different ideas between gain and good. These are two technical terms that the writer uses. The first one is gain. And he says it uh, in the beginning. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? And this word gain in the Hebrew language is an accounting term. It means what? how can I, the, the results of my efforts will produce a tangible and and predictable outcome. What do I gain? And then having gained that, how do I use it for my pleasure? That's one posited worldview, and he has one right alongside it. Rather, what is good for the children of man to do under heaven? And the difference between these two ideas is the one results in frustration and the other results in a profound sense of deep meaning. On the one hand, if I think that every effort I'm going to do in life has some controlled sense of outcome, I'll mostly be right, but when it doesn't happen the way I want it to happen, when life throws me a curve, when things I see injustice and evil is allowed to touch my life, it is extremely frustrating. What good is it? And he results in, by saying, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. It's meaningless if I view the world as something to be manipulated and and to gain and have a a very predictable outcome. Sometimes it is not that way. So he offers this alternative view. Well, if if I can't predict it 100% of the time, well then at least what is God's intention of good? For me, a child of God, trying to live out a a knowledge and faith of, of his principles and so on, what is good? And good, by definition of the writer of Ecclesiastes, is a robust term that includes hard things in life, like the frustrations of injustice. So what is he wants to to, to live a skillful life to say, what is good? What is profitable? What is something that is actually creating deep meaning in my life? And so just remember, any the strength of any worldview is its coherence with the reality of our experience. So if we have a faith in God and we go to church on Sunday and that faith somehow produces a lots of frustration in life and we think and we blame God as a result. God, how is this evil touching my life? You must not be a good God. If we're drawing conclusions that don't 
uh, that aren't true about God, then our worldview is lacking. It needs to be adjusted according to the reality of what we actually experience. Any worldview must stand this scrutiny. For, it, for me to adopt a worldview, or you, or somebody suggests, hey, this is how the world works, it has to relate. We have to say, yep, I, I can see that. I can watch the news. I can see that in my neighbor's life. I can see it in my life. I, I, I see it borne out in my children's lives. It, is, it, it adequately explains the reality. I'm putting forward, as with the writer of Ecclesiastes, that the Bible allows for all of these contingencies and the writer of Ecclesiastes so skillfully brings that to our attention that God is still good and he has a plan that provides deep meaning. So so this morning we are focusing on the meaningful life. The very first Sunday we had the good life, then we had the skillful life, which is the wise life, and we had the better life last Sunday and the meaningful life. Uh, this morning. How do we live life with deep meaning despite the fact that there are frustrations? How do we even explain that? How does that fit into God's big picture? Right? So there's going to be three points. If you're taking notes, there in, the, in your bulletin, there's a space, a blank space. Uh, going to be three points, a part of this outline. Number one is what you're seeing up there on the screen. There, there's deep meaning in God's redemptive plan. It's nice to know that God has a plan. We're not here by random chance. Life doesn't happen by chance and randomness. God is actually working all things according to his will to accomplish a plan. We're going to explain that in a moment. But as you take notes, uh, one thing I often say is you probably, re- sometimes notes are distracting. You're writing and you miss the next thing that's said. And Here's what to focus on. That's what I say very commonly. Um, is if God impresses something in particular that really applies to your life, that is what you should write down because God is using this moment to communicate to you. And sometimes it has something to do with what I'm saying. (laughs) And sometimes it's just something I say triggers a thought that God is communicating to you through. Uh, I think all of us who have been a part of a church service long enough uh, know that both of those take place. Sometimes God uses the speaker on stage and sometimes he just speaks to us uniquely. Write that kind of thing down. So, if we are living a skillful life and adopting a worldview that is, that is adequately explaining the reality in which we experience, um, we have to know that there's a plan. The biblical worldview, what God tells us is, I've got this. I've got a plan. I'm working all things out according to that plan. It may not feel like that at times, but it's helpful for us to see the big picture before we know what our part in that picture is. So let's talk about the big picture. Number one, God created all things with order and reflective of his goodness. We see that right in Genesis 1. In six days, God created everything that we see. He created with order. There are seasons. We can predict when the sun is going to rise, when it's going to set. We know it with such uh, predictability and, and, and accuracy. We know that we have to add a couple days every few years in February. We know we have to reset our clocks, at least we do in California, uh, you know, every once in a while so that we can adjust our schedule because it's, it's so predictable. Summer, winter, fall, spring, all of these things uh, are, are by design, by God, created by God to have order. There's cycles of life, all created with order. And with each day of creation, God declares it is good. So, you know, God's intent with creation is that it has order and that it is good. It reflects his character of goodness. So we see a lot of that line up with what our experience is, but it's not the big picture because it doesn't account for evil. How did evil get here? We've got to answer that question. Evil was introduced to God's creation at the rebellion of Satan and his angels. So one of the first acts of God was to create uh, angelic beings, and they serve a pretty specific purpose of carrying out God's plan and assisting humanity, which God will later create in his creation story. But he starts with them. We don't know when he created the the angels, but it was sometime before uh, he started speaking the world and and the planets and everything, because they were all there watching it happen, the scriptures say. But at some point before the whole Garden of Eden experience, there was a rebellion in heaven where the, one of God's chief angels named Lucifer rebelled against God, and that rebellion created this idea of evil in the world. God allowed this to happen. He's, it's not didn't surprise him. It's something that he had contingencies for. 
It's a part of his bigger plan, but we didn't know it at the time, or the angel, Satan certainly didn't know his demise when he rebelled. He thought he was going to win the rebellion. And God informed him shortly thereafter, no, you're the loser. You're going to be the bad guy in the story. I'm going to be the good guy. Uh, But this is how evil enters. But Satan went right to work in God's good and orderly creation to begin to disrupt things. So he shows up and deceives Eve. And Adam and Eve, existing in this great relationship with God, unbroken communion in a paradise, everything is good were deceived. They themselves bought into Satan's uh, plan and rebelled against God and then suffered the consequences of that. In fact, all of creation suffered the consequences of Adam and Eve's rebellion. The Bible tells us that creation itself was subject to corruption. Now we see even in creation, things like earthquakes and volcanoes going off and, and disorder, despite the fact that God's overall overarching order still is in place. We see how evil is introduced, how mankind, because of our rebellion, now death itself is introduced to our experience. That wasn't a part of God's original plan, though he had contingencies for it because he knows our nature, our free will. So this is all part of God's plan, unfolding. But it gets better. It doesn't end here, thankfully. There's more bullet points (laughs) to get us going on God's plan Number four, though profoundly affected by sin, creation, including mankind, still reflects order and goodness. We can still predict when the sun comes up. Even though we are going to die, we still have a great deal of predictability that we're going to live a pretty, we have somewhat some control of our lives and there is an order to the universe. There's still justice that prevails in the world. Uh, there's still love. We have the ability to love and to act on one another's behalf, to stick up for the weak uh, and, and to provide for one another. We have this great reflection of God's order and goodness still in us and in creation, though it's all been marred, all been corrupted by sin. There's still goodness in the human race. There's still goodness, beauty, music, wonder in creation. And so there's hope, right? And finally, God's plan is to culminate in the redemption of both mankind and creation from the effects of sin and to restore all things to a state of perfection and goodness. So he's going to return it all the way back to how he began, that all things will be good. Every injustice will be accounted for. Everything we've ever experienced that we've never wanted to have experienced, death itself will be redeemed, and we will receive eternal life through our faith in Jesus Christ. This, so when we think about a worldview that, that has to take into account our real experience including evil, we have to understand that God's story, his plan, which spans from the beginning of time to the end of all things, includes these ideas. He's accounted for it. It's a part of how he is working things out. So that's the big picture. Now we have to boil it down to what about our experience? My little place in this bigger plan or my part of the world. So that's our second point that we have to find meaning in our experience of a fallen world. How do do our lives reflect the goodness of God and the order of creation? And how do we account and and process when sin and evil is allowed to touch our lives? How do we do that? God helps us in this process. And we're going to, this is where the writer of Ecclesiastes shines. Remember, he's writing what is, what can be gained or what is Good. If we just think about we're going to control all the things and outcome, we're just going to live a frustrating and meaningless life. But if we understand that good includes God's bigger plan, then we can have a meaningful life. The writer of Ecclesiastes helps us. So here's what the writer poses. Since God created all things with order and goodness, a skillful life, that's the wise life, that's why Ecclesiastes is part of wisdom literature in the Bible, The skillful life would be one which reflects God's good intention. So we have to align our lives according to God's plan. We have to align our lives according to the goodness of God and the order of creation. If we fight the goodness of God, if we fight the order of creation, if we fight against God's plan, our life will be a whole lot more frustrating. 
and we'll end up eternally separated from God. But if we align our hearts with God, it will go better for us. Yes, life will be frustrating, but if we align ourselves, oh, we're going to see so much more goodness. We're going to see so much more, experience love and meaning and beauty and peace, contentment, fulfillment, if we align our lives with God's plan and purpose. So the writer of Ecclesiastes, he says it in this way. In chapter 12, verse 13, this is where our passage we read this morning, the conclusion of all things, here it is, the end of all of the matter has been heard, fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Now, this is not the only place in Ecclesiastes the writer makes this statement. But in the end, he says, and, and it's better we learn this while we're young, because we've got a lot of living to do, and we've got a lot of choices to make. And the sooner we align our lives to the, how the world actually works, according to the created order and the goodness of God, the better it will be for us. In the end, obey God, fear him, honor him, obey his commandments. It's just going to go better. And so that word better is a, is a, 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 a variation of the word gain. So remember we said, what is there to be gained in this world? A variation in Hebrew is translated better. So if gain is our goal, that permanent, I'm going to manipulate and control all things, you're going to be frustrated. Uh, that's a little bit too far. The same Hebrew word, slightly changed, becomes better, an advantage. Well, what is better then? What, what good can I experience? And there's a lot of verses, if you look for them in the book of Ecclesiastes, that have that word better, or what advantage is there? For example, there is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. And this is after making the argument. It's like, what can I gain from all my toil? It's just frustrating. But if we change it to what is good, then it's like, hey, there's just nothing better than to enjoy it for what it is. We talked about that a little bit last week. Eat and drink and find enjoyment in your efforts of your life, though they don't always turn out the way you prefer. This also I saw is from the hand of God. He relates it to someone who is relating to a biblical worldview. Look about Genesis or Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. That's a quality of a person's life who is living according to God's plan, his order and his goodness. It's, nothing, it's going to be better for you when you do that, to be joyful and to do good, to reflect God's goodness as long as you live. Ecclesiastes 4, better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. It's better to be poor and wise than to be a king and to be an idiot, right? He said, it's just better. If you align yourself to the goodness of God, it's just going to go better for you. Even if you're impoverished, it's better to live in accord with God's plan, with the order of God. It's just going to go better than to be have all the power, all the wealth, yet to be a fool. Ecclesiastes 9. But I say that wisdom is better than might. Though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. Even if we're not heard, even if wise, no one's listening to wise words, it's still better, he's saying, than the strong. The strong might say, no, we got all the power, we got all the wealth. We don't need to listen to you poor people. Because with power, you, come, you have authority. You can make decisions, even though you might be a fool. We understand that that is just the case in the world. Sometimes you have wise leaders and sometimes you don't. The reality is, it's still better. Even if I don't have any power over the outcome of things, it's still better to be wise but poor, be wise but young. Because your wisdom, to, according to the writer of Ecclesiastes, is aligning your life according to the order of creation and the goodness of God. So, what about the frustrating parts? What about what, when sin does affect our lives? Even we are pursuing the better passages. And I just gave you a handful. If you just read the 12 chapters of Ecclesiastes, you're going to see uh, uh, so many examples. Chapter 7 is full of them. Uh, it's better to do this. It's better. There is advantage to this, of aligning our lives in this way. But sin is still going to affect us. Sin's going to touch our life. The effects of sin, 
evil is still going to touch our lives. It's, all the hard work in the world doesn't always pay off. The righteous sometimes die young, and the evil sometimes live long and luxurious lives. Life isn't always fair. So what do we do when we experience that? God has a plan for us <laughs> when we experience because he knows we're going to experience this. And this is written right into the fabric of, of the, what the writer will say in Ecclesiastes over and over and over. He says, vanity. Remember, the, it's the Hebrew word, habal, meaningless. It's like chasing after the wind. I can't control the outcome. No matter how hard I work, I can't. No matter how wise I am, I still can't cheat death. I still, you know, a fool can follow me and, and take all of the, after I die and take everything I've earned and, and Waste it away. I can't control it. I cry out, vanity, meaningless, futility. This, according to the writer of Ecclesiastes, is a positive way of expressing frustration. God has space for us to lament, to be angry, to rage against injustice, because God is just. God is good. He laments. He is angry about sin and the effects of sin. So he invites us to do the same. And the writer of Ecclesiastes says it over and over and over. It's just futility. It's meaningless. If I'm trying to control life. But despite when sin affects my life, I can still live a good life. Let us visit for a moment the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is written as a hymnal for the church. Well, for God's people. Because Israel in the Old Testament and the church of the New Testament, we get the privilege of using the Psalms as our personal hymn book to be a voice for what we actually experience in the world. A third of all of the Psalms, actually a little bit more than a third of all the Psalms that are written are laments are actually raging against injustice, raging against, I don't understand, God. You're supposed to intercede right now. How come my life hasn't changed? You're allowing evil to touch my life. I don't understand. God gives us space for those big emotions. It is so important. In fact, there's a writer uh, uh, he's a, a psychologist, a Christian psychologist. His name's Adam Young. And he posits that there are six uh, you know, big things that we, as parents, need to provide for our children. And one of those six, he calls them the big six. If you're interested, that's why I gave you his name, Adam Young. Uh, one of the big six is that we, as parents, help our children by holding space, room, for their big emotions. We want them to feel all of the rain, the full range of human emotion. That's how God created us to feel. He wanted us to feel happiness and joy and laughter and, and, and oh, just a good relationships, all the good things. But God also gave us the ability to feel a longing and sadness and when, when, so, when, when sin touches our life and we lose someone perhaps from a, a deep relationship, either through death or an, another means, he gives us the, the heart to be able to grieve and feel that the loss. And he gives us a range of emotion to, to interpret all of our life's experiences. The Psalms help us to, to express these big emotions, including anger, to God himself. And God invites us to do this. He put it in the hymnal. These are songs, psalms, were meant to be sung by the congregation. We're, these are, I'm going to introduce three here, just by example. That the congregation would come and sing these things, raging against God. I don't know about you. I was not raised to be particularly uh, comfortable raging against God. God, you're sovereign. You're all powerful. Your will be done. Uh, it doesn't really matter what I feel. It doesn't really matter about you know, what, what I'm feeling. In fact, I didn't like any bad emotions, so I just stuffed them down. And in fact, my inability... By the way, if you have a, have, um, a hard time holding space for your child's big emotions, um, I'm right there with you. Uh, my kids are raised 
I, I don't get a do-over. <laughs> I was of the generation who said, you know, you better stop your crying or I'm going to give you something to cry about, you know. Uh, you know, you don't show no emotion around me. I'm going to control you, you know. And uh, why, why was I doing that? Was it helpful to them? Actually, in hindsight, when I think about it, my own heart, my own inability to handle my own big emotions, really, I was shutting them down so that I would feel better. You're crying. You're being so upset over not getting a piece of candy. Um, it, it, it makes me angry. It stirs up in me a, a, a disquieted heart and so on. And I don't like how that makes me feel. So it's just easier for me as a person in authority, as your dad, to say, stop it. So if you've done that, I'm right there with you. My kids turned out okay. I said, you know, you can go to therapy. You can work out the rest of that stuff. <laughs> Uh, how I've, I've, you know, I've, I've troubled you in your life. But the reality is, uh, it is such a big deal. It, it is to hold space for big emotions. It's something I wasn't really equipped for as a parent. And I, I wasn't even equipped to really handle my own big emotions. And as a pastor, I certainly wasn't prepared to handle the big emotions of people. I'm supposed to be shepherding. You know, if someone has any small problem or a big problem in our life, I go straight to problem solving, right? I want you to feel better. I want you to feel, okay, how can we solve this for you? And when some people and many people's problems, I really don't have any control over solving them. It would just, it would ruin my my whole life. I just go, I have no control. I want to quit. I'm a, I'm a failure as a pastor. And God say, no, you're missing the point. What they're feeling over their life circumstance is exactly how I I put it in their heart to feel these big emotions. You just to be more comfortable sitting with them in those emotions. It's okay. Just listen. Empathize. And when I be able to, to connect with my own heart a little bit more and, and empathize with my own losses and feel the big emotions and that I never liked to, to feel, I only wanted to feel happiness and good and fun and laughter. When I started to open my heart to these other things, it allowed me also to open my heart to other people who were experiencing big emotions. I didn't have to fix them. I didn't have to fix their circumstance. Largely, we were so un, we, have, we have a lack of control. And certainly, it's just you see how in the heart of parenting, allowing your child to have big emotions helps them to experience the full range of their own heart. So that's my little soapbox. We're going to move back to the Psalms. And we see God putting in his, his hymnal commanding his people, I'm, I'm, I'm not only going to, man, I could just punch something right now. God says, here's, here's Psalm 27, a hammer. You smash the, you know, the heck out of that car or whatever, you know, whatever, something that feels good. It's like, here's, here's a psalm for you. This is how it's going to express how you're feeling. Thank you, God. God has, has space for our big emotions. So let's grab our Bible. Let's look at Psalm 27. Three psalms, three different kinds of laments. I want you to see these things. Just It's, it's so important for us to see. It's like we want to see the order and goodness of God's creation. Yep, I love it when there's order and goodness. But when evil touches my life, I need to also know that God gives me a voice to express and join him in rage against injustice and anger. And so he feels this way, and he gives us a hymnal to do the very same thing. So let's look at the psalmist experience. This is a psalm of David in Psalm 27. I'm just going to bring out a couple highlights. It's such a beautiful psalm. I can't go into all of the verses. But it says, the Lord is my light. And my, this is verse 1. The Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold of my life. Of whom I should I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, sin is obviously touching the psalmist's life, David's life. Evildoers. And they're, they're adversaries, their foes are coming. They want me to stumble and fall. And though they, an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war rise against me, yet I will be confident. Now, we were only going to re- read that much of the psalm. Boy, that's pretty powerful faith and confidence of, of David. But that's not all he writes. We continue. He, he talks about his desire in verse 4. Man, if I could just live in the house of the Lord all the time, I would. I love you, God, so much. He sees his heart there. And he trusts God, verse 5. He will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the... I I, I believe that that's your intention toward me, God. All the while, the adversaries, the enemies are still encamped. They haven't gone anywhere. Verse 6. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies. I'm confident. It's all I will. 
It hasn't yet happened. They're still at the gates. Verse 7, we get to see a little crack in the armor here. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Okay, God, are you hearing me? Hear, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. You said, seek me, I'm doing that. But the enemy is still at the gate. Maybe you're, maybe you're upset, you're hiding me, hiding from me. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O oh, you who have been my help, cast me not off, forsake me not. O oh, God of my soul. You see the turn of desperation from confidence. My God, he's my, my champion. My enemies not prevail. Are they still there? Yes. Uh, I have sought the Lord. I, will, I love you, God. Are they still there? Yes, they're right outside the gates. Well, Lord, you said seek your face. I'm doing that. Are they there? Yes. The, the, the problem hasn't gone away. Verse 11. You see how the, the heart of the psalmist turns again. Well, then, Lord, teach me. I don't understand. They're, they're still there. Teach me your way, O oh Lord. Lead me on a level path because of my enemies. If they're going to stay encamped out there, help me to learn. I don't know what you want to teach me out of this, God. I'm trying to seek you, but I don't understand. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries. Just, Lord, if you make sure they don't take the city. I don't understand why they, they're allowed to prevail there, and you're, you're not really coming to my rescue. But God, make it so they don't at least take the city, please. I believe, this is how he concludes, I believe, verse 13, that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord. There's our word. The goodness of the Lord. I believe you are good. I'm going to look at you in the land of the living. In other words, I'm not going to die. Wait for the Lord. This is, now he's doing self-talk. David, wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. And the psalm ends. No resolution. They have not left. But the psalmist is lamenting. The psalmist is processing. I did the right things. How come they're still out there? How come the problem hasn't gone away? Whatever you got to teach me, God, I'm open. I'm open. I don't understand. But I want you to teach me, and I'm going to wait for you. I'm not going to put my confidence in another king, another kingdom to rescue me. My confidence is in you and Come hell or high water, I will make my stand. I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to wait on you. These are hard words that God gives us as a gift to be able to pray through the Psalms when we are experiencing similar emotions. Let's go a little harder. Psalm 44. Turn right in your Bible, a few pages. Uh, This one's even uh, a little bit harder to deal with. It's a longer Psalm. Again, I'm going to grab a couple of, of verses here. The first several verses, the psalmist is recounting all of the history of Israel and how God rescued them, how God was their champion, how God stood up for them, though they were a small nation uh, set set apart from bigger, more powerful nations, God would deliver them. Oh God, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. How with your own hand drove out the nations, But them you planted, Israel you planted, and remained secure. You afflicted the peoples, but them, Israel, you set free. All this great history of Israel, how God acted on their behalf. Verse 4, you are my king, O God, ordain salvation for Jacob. Though we push down our foes through your name, or through you we, we push down our foes. Through your name we tread down those who rise up against us. For not in my bow do I trust. Nor can my sword save me, but you have saved me from our foes who have put our shame to those who hate. So this grace, again, it starts out so great. Lots of trust. Look at all the history of God's redemptive power on Israel's behalf. And here's, here's the turn in verse 8. In God we have boasted continually, and we will give thanks to your name forever. So they've talked a lot about it, talked a big talk. God, now it's on you. Verse 9, but... Sometimes when the the word but enters, it is a big but. But you have rejected us. We've heard all the stories, God. Part of the Red Sea, 
you know, pillar of fire by night, clouded, routing the enemy. What about us? You have rejected us and disgraced us. We boasted, God, and you've disgraced us. You've let us down. And you have not gone out with our armies. You have made us turn back from the foe. Those who hate us have gotten the spoil. They're the ones that have won. God, what's going on? This is unfair. This is not right. This is unjust. You've made us, verse 13, you have made us a taunt of our neighbors, a derision and scorn for those around us. Because we're putting our trust in you, and we're failing. We're losing. You look like a weak God. You make us look stupid. This is in the Psalms. And and the psalmist, God is saying, yeah, sing these words, because I know that's how it feels. Verse 17, all this has come upon us, though we have not forgotten you. We have not been false to your covenant. This is the heart of the injustice. God, we've served you. We've done exactly what you've called it. Remember Psalm 27, you said, seek my face. I'm seeking your face. We've kept all the commandments. We're doing, we haven't done anything. We've checked our own hearts. We're not doing anything. Why is this bad stuff happening? Our heart is not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. You have broken us in the place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would God not discover this? But that's not what we've done. He knows the secrets of our heart. Yet for your sake, we are killed all day long. We keep holding your name out there and we keep losing. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Here it is, verse 23. Wake up, God. You ever pray that prayer? Oh, man. I was not taught to pray such prayers. I was taught to pray the first parts of the Psalms, <laughs> not these. Wake up. You're sleeping. Dare we pray such prayers before the Almighty God? Yes. God says, I want you to pray these prayers. Wake up. Why are you sleeping? Rouse yourself. Don't reject us forever. Why would you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly clings to the ground. Rise up. Come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. For your sake, for your good name, at least act, if it's not for us. Redeem us according to your steadfast love. And the psalm ends. Because that's how life feels. We see the order and goodness of God's creation, but sometimes when sin affects our lives, when evil is allowed to touch our lives, it is so painful. And we don't understand why. Why is I'm trying to serve you, Lord. Or this, my loved one who I'm praying for has just been afflicted terribly, and they were, they're such faithful people. They're serving you. God, my... Why? Why would this calamity befall this child? Why was? Why is a child allowed to be harmed, to be put in uh, slavery? Why are people allowed to be to be oppressed, the poor taken advantage of? God, why? Wake up! Do something. God says, "Understand my plan. I am doing things. I am working it out." But when evil touches your life, you have words. You have a voice. God says, I have space for your big emotions. It's okay. I lament with you. I cry out against this adjustment, this injustice with you. I am feeling these things with you. You are not alone. Turn to Psalm 22. Turn left. A few pages. Psalm 22. And we know that God is feeling this with us because Jesus himself became a man. God's son, who existed in eternity past in the realms of glory with God himself, decided, I'm going to take on flesh. I'm going to rescue humanity. The only way I can rescue humanity is if I live out a life just like they do and die and suffer like they do to redeem them from sin. And while on the cross, an innocent man who had done never any sin, the Son of God, is nailed to the cross, having been beaten, having been mocked, stripped naked, and now 
hanging naked and continuing to be mocked from the cross knows what it feels like for you and I to, to suffer, to feel pain, to feel injustice. And he says these words. He himself quotes Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knows what it feels like to be forsaken, to be beaten, for his beard to be plucked out, to be a finger pointed at him and to to be mocked and shamed, to be beaten with no clothes on. It was much of a sexual assault as it was a beating. Jesus knows as I died, so that you could be redeemed from all of this. When evil touches your life, you have to know, I know what that feels like. And one day, it will all be made right. If we just continue to to read the words that we just assume are in Jesus' mind when he quotes the psalm, why are you so far from saving me? The words of my groaning, another psalm of lament. My God, I cry out to you by day, but you do not answer by night, and I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But that's not my experience. Look, verse 7, all who seek me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in the Lord. Mocking Jesus on the cross, the very Son of God. Jesus knows what you feel when you experience injustice, when evil touches your life. He knows. And these psalms are given us to express these deep and full emotions that we feel while we keep in mind the big plan of God, which has does have as a resolution. And that resolution is in the full redemption at Christ's return. One day Jesus is coming back. He's already paid the price for sin and the effects of sin and evil. But when he comes back, he will make all the wrongs right. And justice will prevail. And he will deliver us from this world and he will bring us into the presence of God forever. He's going to recreate the heaven and the earth back into goodness and order. And there will be no effect of sin, no more death, no more crying, no more tears. And we will live together with God in unbroken communion. The full redemption of God will take place. We must be willing to wait. And this is how the writer of Ecclesiastes ends. In the end of the matter, as all been heard, fear God, keep his commandments. That's better to reflect the order and goodness of God. This is the whole duty of man. For God, in the end, for redemption, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. We will receive a reward for our faithfulness. We will receive justice for the injustice that has been are being allowed to experience. And those who have prevailed in this life in their injustice will answer. Satan himself will answer for the disruption of the human race. And he will be eternally condemned and set apart, as will all of those who have rejected Jesus as the provision of this salvation from God. So the writer of Ecclesiastes, is he a cynic? Or is he holding out hope and goodness and profound meaning for us? And to, to, uh, wisdom to navigate this world, to cry out to God, to trust in God, knowing that God has a plan. And though I don't always understand his plan, he gives me a voice to proclaim it. He understands what I'm feeling because he has experienced it himself. And he laments with me. And he will bring about, in his good time, the redemption of all things. I'm going to invite Jonathan and Martha to come up. We're going to end our service with this 
idea of trusting in God, though we don't always get to see, maybe even in our lifetime, how it's going to work out. Sometimes we do. We get to see in our life how things work out. I'm glad. I've seen it many times. But sometimes we don't. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to wait on him no matter what. Let's stand together as we sing this final song. to end this war I confess my hands are weary I need your breath mighty warrior king of the fight no matter what I face you're by my side when you don't move the mountains I'm needing you to move when you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. Truth is, you know what tomorrow brings. There's not a day Seen. So in all things be my life and breath. I want what you want, Lord, and nothing less. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you. I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. You are my strength and comfort. You are my steady hand. You are my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand. Your ways are always higher, your plans are always good. There's not a place where I go, you've not already stood. You don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you. God, teach us, help us in our weakness to trust in you today. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your love for us. We pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Go in peace. Grace and peace to you.